Well, hello, and welcome to today's American Nuclear Society event, Creating a Safe, Secure, and Healthy Global Nuclear Industry. I'm Craig Piercy, the Executive Director and CEO of ANS, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's panel discussion. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of quick notes regarding today's events. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function. I will attempt to address as many questions as possible. I suspect I probably won't get to them all. We'll try to answer the rest online. Uh, the event will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to event registrants tomorrow. Uh, additionally, certificates of attendance for the event are available by request. Please see the chat for contact information. And finally, we ask that all participants adhere to the ANS Code of Ethics and Respectful Behavior Policy, which can be found at ans.org. So with that note, with those notes out of the way, let's get right into it. So today, we're going to be exploring the role of nuclear safeguards and security in what has become a rapidly changing energy, climate, and geopolitical environment. A significant global expansion of nuclear energy, as well as its attendant supply chain and infrastructure, is becoming more inevitable by the day. This inevitability will require fresh thinking about how we best assess and manage the, prol the proliferation risks we face. Thankfully, there are innovations in safeguards and security technology on the way that can increase security in an era of uh, of and while managing increased presence and availability of nuclear energy. Ultimately, this will allow us to hopefully reap the benefits of, decarbon of decarbonizing nuclear energy while avoiding the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, so we have three great guests to have a conversation about these issues today. Uh, Dr. Jatia Hart is the director of INL's Nuclear Nonproliferation Division where she leads a team of scientists, engineers, and researchers overseeing 150 million in programs. Uh, previously, she served as the chief scientist for INL's National and Homeland Security Directorate. Uh, Dr. Anaga Iyengar is the deputy program manager for analytics and innovation in DOE NNSA's Office of International Nuclear Security. In this role, she oversees programs responsible for understanding and developing capabilities and tools to reduce risks of nuclear terrorism and other security challenges posed by emerging technologies. And last but not least, William Toby directs the Office of National Security and International Studies at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's also a senior fellow with the Avoiding Great Power Wars Project at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center, and previously well served as Deputy Administrator for Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation at the NNSA from 2006 to 2009. So welcome, everybody. Go ahead and turn your cameras on and microphones on. And uh, let, let me get us kicked off here. Uh, Anaga, I'm going to go to you first, but I'm going to ask everybody on the panel the same question. So clearly there's an evolution of thinking in the nuclear safety and security world about the role of commercial nuclear power. So two weeks ago, uh, I had the honor and pleasure of attending uh, COP28 and the announcement by the US and 23 other nations, their commitment to triple nuclear energy generation capacity by 2050. Uh, has the emphasis changed in the nonproliferation community from controlling the technology to enabling a safe and secure expansion of that, te that technology, um, you know, how do the, the changes and evolutions in the larger environment change what you do? Uh, Anaga, take it away. Thanks, Craig. And, and thank you, ANS, for hosting a webinar on this really important topic. So you, you highlighted the declaration uh, that was promoted and uh, the commitment that 20 something nations made a couple of weeks ago at COP. Uh, so if you look at that statement, it included a recognition of the importance of 3S, the 3S is being safety, security and safeguards and its role in tripling energy capacity by 2050. So uh, for us and NNSA in the offices of international nuclear security and safeguards, we don't really view this as a change in emphasis per se, if anything, this just gives credence to our mission. 
So for us at NNSA, uh, while it doesn't change what we do, it may change how we do it, right? So we need to come up with new ways of engaging the U.S. nuclear industry that invites them to the table to help them understand how incorporating safety, security, and safeguards is beneficial for everyone earlier in the design process. So I actually have a, a couple of slides that I'd like to run through just to, you know, uh, underscore the message here from uh, the NNSA side. Uh, so please let me know once you're able to see my slides. We have them on and yeah, there we go. We can see them. Okay, great. So again, uh, you know, I'm speaking from the perspective of NNSA. Uh, most people associate NNSA with the export control side of the house, but we have programs dedicated towards international security and safeguards. And in the past few years, we've actually stood up a uh, program specifically focused on, on supporting U.S. nuclear industry uh, and reactor developers, you know, one program being the ARISE program, the Advanced Reactor International Safeguards Engagement Program, and the other focused on security, the INSTAR program, the International Nuclear Security for Advanced Reactors. So I, we like to show this uh, image at the start of uh, a lot of our presentations just to give everyone a context for how big the market is. It's pretty big and it's global. Um, so if you think about it, if there are these many countries that want to supply nuclear technologies, how many are going to end up being customers? Uh, so on this, in this image, you can see that the U.S. has the most proposed designs than any other single country. And, you know, we we're finding that the combination of enthusiasm and ideas is really exciting. But as we're getting to talk to the nuclear industry, we realize that there's this larger gap between design and operational reality, as most designers understandably don't wake up in the morning focused on non-proliferation and security. So most of the countries that, you know, U.S. vendors are considering exporting to, uh, you know, those are shown in green on this map. Uh, and those countries are nuclear non-proliferation treaty or NPT non-nuclear weapon states. So that means they have a legal obligation to place their civil nuclear facilities and activities under IAEA or international safeguards. So again, this is to ensure that the materials and facilities are not being misused or diverted by the country itself for illicit or weaponization purposes. So from the security standpoint, we complement nuclear safeguards, but instead of the threat actor being the country or the state itself, we're not talking about non-state actors, which could include insiders, external adversaries, or collusion by insiders and outsiders. So we're promoting safeguards and security by design as concepts and ways that U.S. nuclear industry and the community can buy down the risk. So when we say safeguards by design, we're talking about the integration of safeguards considerations into the design process from early planning through design, construction, operation, waste management, and decommissioning. You know, it's from a safeguard standpoint, it's uh, uh, the image on the left, it could in involve making room for IAEA safeguards monitoring equipment. Um, and it's often a discussion that takes place between the country, the designer, the operator, regulator, and the IAEA. And when we talk about security by design, it's, it's a risk-based approach to eliminate vulnerabilities to theft and sabotage and unauthorized access of the facility. Uh, so similar to safeguards, it involves an early dialogue between the state designer and the facility uh, and the operators. And you know, some uh, elements of security by design can include optimizing the site layout before the design is finalized, uh, putting in place detection technologies to be able to detect your potential adversaries earlier. So the new advanced and small modular reactor fleet, as uh, most people listening in on this webinar and, and participating here know that there's, the designs will vary significantly in design and operational modes from the current large light water reactor fleet. Uh, and those actually pose some uh, new challenges for the safeguards and security community that we have to actively tackle. Uh, so existing guidelines and regulations for applying safeguards and security policies were developed with these large light water reactors in mind. So the variations uh, that you see here introduce a number of potential safeguards and security challenges that our programs are working towards addressing. So we're going from large fixed sites to smaller transportable modules this introduces a variety of challenges from a transport security perspective or an accountancy standpoint, 
How do you ensure that transit states and countries are best positioned to address potential security risks and threats? Uh, vendors are going from site-specific and really bespoke designs to factory fabricated and mass produced designs. So how do you ensure that those designs are robust enough from a security standpoint to adapt to various design basis threats? And from the safeguard standpoint, if your components are fabricated and loaded and sealed in one country and exported to another, where does accountancy and verification, where does that responsibility begin? Uh, and when you're talking about new fuel types, a lot of these designs are looking at high assay, low enriched uranium or HALU. Those could require category two security measures. And when you're thinking about different fuel types going from item facilities to bulk facilities, like with pebble beds or molten salt reactors, those challenge existing approaches for nuclear material accounting and control. So that combined with the fact that there's a lot of non-traditional operating environments that are being considered for these new reactors, like remote, remote location deployment, co-location with industrial processes, it exposes your design and, and your, your facility to a wider range of adversaries uh, and, and can introduce other safeguard challenges for the IAEA. Um, so the further your design is, or a design is from the standard large uh, light water reactor supply chain or technology, the more necessary it becomes for the community to come together and develop new safeguards and security approaches. So a, a lot of the challenges I, I mentioned can be broken down into the national level and site level, right? At the national level, we need to develop policies that make sense with these new business models and provide guidelines to an international supply chain and customer base so they can be good stewards of this technology. And at the site level, you know, we have to de develop designs that and, and, and approaches that work for uh, uh, these reactors and the operational models they have in mind. And when you're thinking about it from the customer's uh, perspective and these countries that want to acquire new nuclear safety, security, and safeguards are just three of 19 infrastructure issues that they have to think about as they're embarking or expanding on nuclear power programs. So um, by easing the burden on the customers of these technologies from a 3S perspective, designers can really make their concepts more marketable in the long run. So um, we like to show this combined life cycle model here uh, to show where safeguards and security are typically considered. Uh, so for the traditional reactor fleet, it's somewhat, there's somewhat of a delineation of who's on primary for certain actions and licensing goals. Uh, the safeguards and security burden typically falls to the operator or the end, use, end user of the reactor, whereas safety, understandably, is considered throughout the life cycle. Um, but especially as we're moving towards smaller technologies, the cost to retrofit a design is going to increase down the road as, as you're moving down this design uh, readiness level. Um, so a business case can really be made to incorporate safeguards and security earlier into the design process. So that's where uh, uh, safeguards and security by design come in, um, with the goal of being to alleviate costs to incorporate the design changes if the utility and operator doesn't have to retrofit these designs after the fact. Um, and then, you know, through NNSA, we've established two programs I mentioned earlier, Arise and Instar, to work with uh, the U.S. nuclear industry to tackle these problems. Our goals are to help educate the U.S. reactor vendors um, uh, and uh, stakeholders about safeguards and security challenges. Uh, we do this through our national lab community. We uh, provide funds to the national labs to work with vendors directly under NDAs or CRADAs um, to help uh, understand what design changes can be made now versus you know, down the road, um, even if you're not thinking about exporting your technology 10 years from now. So uh, these programs were congressionally mandated and we established these in 2020. So just to come back to that question you asked earlier, Craig, uh, uh, a lot of the energy around nuclear energy and, and civil nuclear has really shifted how NNSA is trying to support um, U.S. nuclear. And these programs are a critical piece of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Anika. So, uh, Jatia, I want to go to you uh, because in many ways, you're sort of right at the, you know, the intersection of the benefits and risks of nuclear technology in your role at INL. You know, talk a little bit about what you do, the programs that you have at INL. And again, it's this issue of the world is changing. How are, you know, how are you skating to the puck? 
<clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, this is one of my favorite subjects to discuss. Um, absolutely. So um, this is right in my wheelhouse and I'll try to make sure I don't uh, uh, duplicate some of the things that uh, Anaga was saying, um, which you beautifully covered some of the NNSA efforts. But um, as a division director in uh, of nuclear nonproliferation, I, I am in the National and Homeland Security Directorate, so focused on security but also applied towards uh, nuclear energy and nuclear technologies. So um, I'll try here to share my screen. And Craig, if you can let me know when you do see that, that'd be great. Yep, I, I see it, uh, oh. I see it up now, yes. Fantastic. So I just wanted to, to touch on a couple of things that came to the forefront. Um, obviously we don't have time to cover every uh, subject or, or thought um, when it comes into uh, the global nuclear industry and, and how it's changing. Um, but I think we started, uh, and I believe that both Craig and Anaga hit on these issues um, about COP. And we have this pledge to significantly decrease and transition away from fossil fuels um, also by supplementing that change with nuclear energy, which is going uh, to not only uh, affect the U.S. greatly um, with more adoption of nuclear energy, but internationally. And as Anna showed in her uh, diagram, all of the countries that are moving towards or interested in nuclear reactor, it's it's pretty much uh, across the globe, touching every different region. So nuclear energy is no longer just a U.S. problem or a U.S. and a couple of states problem. It's it's global. Um, and it's going to have to step up to address some of the other global challenges that we see, such as climate change, and that we have already agreed to address. So um, I think DOE, being a DOE any laboratory and also being an um, a any advisory committee member, um, I've heard a lot about what any is doing to accelerate um, and support the advancement of nuclear energy through their commercial liftoff uh, report that they recently put out um, that really went through a lot of the details about the technologies that they are committed to supporting and the value proposition. I think that was a, a key thing that was discussed in detail um, in the commercial liftoff report was uh, what everybody wants to know. How, how affordable is this? What are the key variables that affect the affordability and the cost? Um, which I think is one of the largest barriers to adoption um, is the, the threat of overruns and this financial liability, especially if you are a first of a kind plant versus um, the older technologies or um, more proven technologies that have already been deployed. And I thought that was addressed really well. But um, both of these reports show that uh, domestically we have uh, bought into and are supporting nuclear energy deployment, not only domestically, but internationally. Um, and also you can see from the outcomes of COP that that's where we're going. The train has left the station. I think this is just um, reinforcing what we already knew and what DOE, NE, INL, and also NNSA have been planning for. So on to kind of my major thoughts on um, what we should be uh, focusing on to support this accelerated demonstration and deployment, first of all, advanced reactors. Um, I, I see through my work that the thought of a classic one gigawatt, you know, nuclear power plant um, is very daunting for a lot of these nations. And a lot of them are clamoring for right size or smaller sized um, reactors that can fit into their grid. Um, a lot of the countries, again, the Anaga showed, um, their, their grids are the problem. Like it, it, there is a possibility that you could put up a gigawatt size reactor, but what would the grid do to support that, to do distribution around to certain areas and to make use of all of that energy um, being generated in one single place at a time. So with the deployment of these advanced reactor uh, concepts, um, they have actual options to um, look at what type of capacity they want to have and what kind of deployment and how often they want to refuel if they want to have battery technology. We have all of these different concepts in development. And the first step to their actually having uh, commercial deployment um, is for them to be demonstrated. 
So this is a timeline that we use pretty often um, at Idaho National Laboratory, and it shows um, some of the projects that we are working on um, getting up and running and actually uh, demonstrated at Idaho National Laboratory, or at least in conjunction <clears throat> with our researchers. So we have our Marvel project, and that's a DOE microreactor. And these are just a, I won't go through all of them because um, thankfully we have a lot of them um, being planned. But the ones that are um, uh, closest in time scale are the Marvel project and also Project Pele. Um, Mar Marvel is a, a micro demonstration plant um, funded by DOE, and Project Pele is actually a DOD, Department of Defense project um, that's being led by BWXT. Um, and then we also have NRIG, our National Reactor Innovation Center, and we are developing a dome, which is um, going to be a test bed so that commercial deployment um, can actually have their first demonstration reactor at Idaho National Laboratory um, as a proof of concept. Um, that is really, I feel like, a, a key uh, area that needs to um, have the focus and success um, to go out and start this uh, uh, this goal towards having nuclear energy uh, serve as a larger uh, uh, generation uh, in the global portfolio. Um, I think beyond um, doing their advanced reactor uh, development and demonstration, there needs to be this 3S collaboration that's beyond the norm. So yes, we talk about you know the nuclear part of things, but we also need to look at some things that go into design and development that are beyond the nuclear energy or nuclear safety, such as cybersecurity. Um, and it's becoming more and more apparent that cybersecurity um, cannot be an afterthought when we're talking about nuclear energy and nuclear power production, especially when we look at um, how much of a role that energy plays when we uh, look in global conflict. If you look at um, what's happening in Ukraine and some of their um, natural resources or uh, energy resources being cut down and also the threat that was uh, that uh, arose from having Russian forces um, being so close to a nuclear power plant, um, not you can just see how that plays into it. So it's not just the operation of the nuclear power plant, but it's just, you know, being able to generate power, what other things going in, go into the operation of the plant, the surroundings of the plant, and all of this um, envelop enveloping um, issues that go into reactor deployment and not just actual generation and capacity and those sort of things. It also showed us um, about um, how we need to have private and public partnerships. Um, it can't be all one way or the other. Um, we have to have the people who have this expertise in these realms beyond just nuclear uh, generation, talking to the cybersecurity people, um, talking to the people at the laboratories who are doing R&D and are, are on the forefront of those issues, talking to the commercial developers as well. Um, we talked about a couple of, um, of these private public partnerships um, one is the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear that actually puts together some of the developers of these reactor concepts with R&D uh, research staff to talk about some of the things that are on the, on the forefront to include in their design um, that involve safety, security, and safeguards. Trying to get to my next slide here. Uh, so another issue that we do have to think about um, if we're going to talk about the expansion of nuclear energy is the back end. Um, it is uh, at a standstill. Right now, DOE NE is really calling for consent-based sightings. They recently released um, some community partnerships that could look at um, community needs um, concerning sighting issues or uh, the availability of siting or the openness to communities to even talk about being a part of the nuclear energy expansion um, in any kind of capable way. I think that is um, a very good step forward. Um, before we talk about deployment, we do need to figure out um, what we're gonna do with the back end. And it seems like the only way forward is to have a consensus um, in how we're gonna do that from cradle to grave. And the grave part um, being the issue and the, and the sticking point here. 
I think that's also talked about in the DOE liftoff report, which I also cite in this slide. And then personally, um, my favorite topic is uh, knowledge capture and retention. So we talk about the U.S. being able to um, add to uh, the different calls to action to increase nuclear energy. But we have to realize that, the, you know, the U.S., we um, our, our footprint, I will say, in the nuclear energy um, forefront and building and operating reactors um, is, is graying. I won't say it's shrinking, but I will say it's graying. So we do need to um, work to make sure that we capture the knowledge that we have um, from being so involved in <clears throat> this industry from the very start. But we also need to bring in more people to make sure that that knowledge is captured and retained. And also that we have people who are as interested in the viability of the U.S. Uh, domestic nuclear capability and also serving to help um, expand the international uh, capability. So there are some really good programs that have come out lately from the Nonproliferation Stewardship Program that's been developing test beds. Um, one that's at the U uh, that at, is at the INL is Moran, and it's a plutonium uh, material test bed. I mean, we have other test beds under development, but this gives on hands-on um, training. Um, with equipment that is used in uh, nuclear fuel cycle um, material and processing. Um, and that has been uh, an amazingly successful program. Other programs to widen the pipeline include diversity, equity, inclusion efforts. Um, some great ones that have uh, recently come out from the IEA are um, the Marie Curie Fellowship, um, that gives uh, educational support to women who are pursuing nuclear energy or, or adjacent topics, and also uh, recently the Lee's Meitner program that DOE supported where it is a professional um, rotation where uh, there's a cohort of women who get to uh, visit facilities in the U.S. and it's a professional exchange so that we can strengthen that pipeline and widen it to include more women. Um, that's all I have for my opening statement. Sorry if I went a little long. Like I said, this is one of my favorite topics. So uh, you should have known when you asked me to be here, but I'm looking forward to questions um, about any of these topics. Anyway. Well, we've got an hour, so we've got a little bit of time and, and uh, the questions are coming in. But before we get there, uh, uh, Bill to uh, William Toby, can you turn, there we go, turn your camera on. You've obviously uh, been in this game a long time, uh, having served in the Bush administration and really have seen the evolution of nuclear over you know, a period of decades here. Uh, how would you describe the position that we're in now? And, you know, and how does that change the way that you look at the technology and, and the opportunities for uh, 3S moving forward? So I think the position we're in now is one of uh, cross currents. We're seeing currents headed in different directions. Obviously, the results from COP28 were a strong endorsement of increase for nuclear energy. Um, and there are other uh, forces that move in that direction, including technological developments, although there have recently been some setbacks financially with respect to uh, small modular reactors. Working against those forces, and they're very strong and they're important, and I don't in any way mean to contradict anything that Anagar or Jatia have said. I think their perspectives are exactly right. But at the same time, we're seeing an attack on the international nuclear order by Russia. And that context is important. Much of it has to do with the military and security domains. And I realize that this group may be most interested in the commercial implications, but I believe that the context matters to publics. And the way that publics look at these issues, they sort of bind up all kinds of nuclear issues together. Um, and so if you look at the pillars of the international nuclear order, I would argue that there are several. There is deterrence, arms control, nonproliferation, and nuclear security. And in all of those areas, Russia is not merely vandal, uh, not merely violating them, it is vandalizing uh, the international nuclear order. It's the difference between merely speeding and running around and pulling up all the speed limit signs. 
With respect to deterrence, Moscow is placing a greater emphasis on nuclear weapons. It has brandished nuclear weapons against Ukraine and the Western Alliance. I don't need to go into the great detail there, but it looks like they are going to uh, place an even greater emphasis in the future, given the deficiencies of their conventional forces. On arms control, the New START Treaty runs out in February of 2026. Uh, even before the war in Ukraine, the odds of ratifying a follow-on agreement, I think, were fairly small. Now, I think it will be virtually impossible to negotiate, let alone to put into place a new arms control agreement. With respect to non-proliferation, um, Russia's violation of the Budapest Agreement, in which Ukraine gave up its nuclear stockpiles left over from the Soviet Union in return for security guarantees, I think has got to make other nation states think twice about the value of such security guarantees. The effects will be to more nuclear weapons latency, uh, the seeking of more assurance through extended deterrence from the United States and others. Um, it may also have effects on the Iran and North Korea issues. So, for example, Russia is now dependent on Iran and North Korea to supply drones and missiles uh, and artillery. Um, it's very difficult to see a scenario in which Moscow would allow Iran or North Korea to be brought before the Security Council on nuclear issues, given that they're dependent on their support. And then finally, in the nonproliferation realm, the non-aligned movement may become increasingly uh, frustrated with the lack of progress in the arms control area, and that may have an effect on that. In, in perhaps the, the greatest effects are in the area of nuclear security. All of our programs were built on the assumption that the primary, if not the only, threat to nuclear security came from non-state actors. And we designed our, you know, we, we built our design basis threats uh, and our programs um, based on that assumption, now we see direct attacks on nuclear facility, nuclear and radiological facilities by Russia. And frankly, the threats are probably not limited to Russia. Um, we've seen drone and missile attacks on critical infrastructure in the Middle East, not yet on nuclear facilities, but it's a sort of short leap of imagination to see that pro problem widened. And all of the reactors in Japan and South Korea are within range of North Korean conventional missiles that are sufficiently accurate to, to strike them. So those present new challenges. Um, add to that the fact that drones and cyber attacks can cross borders and oceans relatively easily. And the nuclear security problem is far more complex than it was a couple of decades ago. There are some encouraging signs as well. Um, my guess is that Russia's um, actions may provide commercial openings as the unreliability of Russian supply chains becomes more and more evident. Secondly, um, it may create international openings as I, Russia is increasingly isolated in international fora. Uh, for example, the IAEA has operated by consensus, and by consensus they mean unanimity, but votes are possible. And if Russia continues to block all actions at the IAEA, it may find itself on the losing end of, of pretty lopsided votes. And then uh, finally, um, Russia's actions have in general encouraged like-minded nations to draw together. And those nations tend to be ones that have used or been able to supply uh, nuclear power. So we and our allies may have closer relations to include how we approach approach nuclear issues. So it's there are some challenges, but it's not all bad news. Well, thank you, Will. I, I want to stay with you for a minute and then I'll come back down to the uh, come back down to the panel. But I want to pick up on I think something that you, that you just said there, which is, you know, we could very easily see in the future sort of coalitions of countries coming together around nuclear, each, you know, sort of, I don't want to distill it down to good guys and bad guys, but for, for this purpose, you have 
countries that are interested in maintaining the commitments, maintaining the, the letter and the spirit of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, and therefore are going to have, you know, high standards for safeguards, security, international inspections, and so forth. And then, and then, you know, you have the, the um, you know, I don't want to name country names, you name Russia, there are others that might choose a lower standard. Um, I guess my, you know, my, my question is, is that, you know, do you see it going that way? And I guess, in, you know, specifically in the area of, of um, international cooperation, do you think that, that there is an advantage for countries to join the good guys and a significant disadvantage to join the bad guys? And that plays out in, in a more of a strategic diplomatic dialogue. I mean, is that how you see that going forward? And, and, and what else would you add to that? I do. And I would argue that historically, um, U.S. safety, security, and safeguards standards have been a source of comparative advantage for our nuclear suppliers and for, frankly, Western nuclear suppliers. I don't mean to exclude our allies on that point. Yeah. Um, I, I also think that another dynamic that may occur, and we've yet to see this play out, but to the extent that Russia, Ross Adam, faces further sanctions based on the war in Ukraine, it may drive Russia toward customers that are less and less capable of dealing with a nuclear industry and might present greater safety, security, and safeguards threats. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, William. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our other two panelists to go ahead and and turn on your camera, and uh, um, you can have a, a hot thumb on the mic, uh, you know, on the microphone button. But GT, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, you know, again, you sort of identified all of the various elements of INL's initiative to to develop new reactors, and and talked about how safeguards sort of you know how safeguards fits in those. Uh, but sort of two questions, you know, first is, um, do you find that safeguards is integrated into all of the, you know, all of the programs equally like NRIC and GAIN? Is it, is it sort of a constant thread among all of the, the products, the services, the research capabilities that INL um, supports? And then another question sort of specific to the chat is, is to what extent are the new facilities at INL integrating safeguards in their design um, as, as if they were going to meet IAEA safeguards for non-weapon states? So I will say that um, uh, at INL, um, we in uh, National and Homeland Security uh, always try to navigate and, and keep lines open um, to our partner programs like NRIG, Na National uh, Reactor Innovation Center, uh, DOE GAIN, which is located here, and all of those problem uh, uh, partnerships with commercial developers. Um, so we try to put safeguards into the conversation whenever we can, and we have liaisons to, uh, to those organizations who talk about that. There's also um, a, a broader mechanism for uh, bringing that into the conversation through NNSA's answer program. And this is the Advanced Nuclear Security Waste and Energy R&D. So this is when you are developing your commercial reactor concept and you want to reach out to think, you know, um, put some forethought into some of the security and safeguards, you can actually reach out and be connected with national lab, uh, laboratory staff, who can help you think through those possibilities and to integrate those into the design. Um, I think that I'm pretty sure, and I, I, I don't want to you know, talk about anybody's design, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that every designer understands um, that there is um, definitely a, situ a situation where you will have to apply IEA safeguards to your reactor that is deployed. Um, and so they hopefully have looked into that um, and reached out for uh, technical review. I know we have reviewed some technical designs for not only safeguards um, implications, but also for cybersecurity in, uh, implications um, and to give some insight into that process. And that has affected the design um, 
and what they are uh, putting together for those concepts. Not, I can't say for every single one of them, but for I, I, at least two or three of those, um, definitely Marvel because it's being deployed um, at INL and we are very involved in that, but for some other of these uh, commercial um, and government projects that we have going on. Um, I'm gonna stop there. I hope that answers the question. If not, please feel free. Like I said, this is my favorite topic. So please feel free to um, ask a follow-up question in the chat and I'll answer it. I, I think that was, a, that was a good first swat, Jatia. Thank you. So Anika, I wanna to come to you. It's a similar question, but it, it's really more um, from a practical perspective, how do you and your team at NNSA um, work with industry? I mean, we, you, you talked about getting involved earlier in the process. And I, and I want to bring in a question from the chat here um, to kind of, you know, put a little bit more color on this, which is um, you would expect that integrating security and design would be an easy sell for U.S. reactor designers because all the reactors in the U.S. must address physical protection against sabotage, and if applicable, theft. Um, however, U.S. reactors don't have the same safeguards requirement as non-weapon state reactors, right? Is that consistent with what you're seeing with reactor designers? Um, you know, are, is, is, are, they look, are they all looking at them in terms of, of non-weapon states market and working, you know, working on that basis from the beginning? Uh, but, you know, again, Talk a little bit about how you work with industry and how industry is looking at that domestic versus international weapons versus non-weapons. Yeah, thanks. I think I'll tackle the second part of your question first and then, then talk about what we're doing. Um, in our conversations with vendors, yes, they understand the importance of safeguards and security and the role it plays in deploying uh, and enabling nuclear energy, but the integration point is where there's a little bit of a disconnect and there's not really uh, the, the non-pro security community wants to advocate for earlier is better. But from the vendor community standpoint, they're really, they, they aren't seeing enough data points that there is an ROI to think about it right now, right? There's a lot of competing priorities in, in the technology development standpoint, right? There's a lot of critical milestones people have to meet from an R&D standpoint to prove these technologies out. And, and the way our nuclear engineering community and priorities have evolved, it just happens to be the case that safety is the primary driver and understandably so, but safeguards and security uh, aren't really critical pieces, right? They're a little bit more of an afterthought. And for our vendors in the US, growing up in a nuclear weapon state places them at a little bit of a disadvantage, right? They're not, the US being a nuclear weapon state is not subject to the same legal requirements as a non-nuclear weapon state is, uh, or an NPT signatory non-nuclear weapon state is. So uh, we don't have to put our facilities through the same level of rigor when it comes to international safeguards. Um, however, you know, with these new designs coming about, there is a potential chance that even if you're building your first of a kind in the United States, your facility could be placed under IAEA safeguards to offer the agency or the IAEA a chance to learn about how to apply safeguards to these types of facilities and gather lessons learned. Um, so absolutely, there is a business case to be made here. And that's something that we're trying within NNSA to be better at communicating uh, externally so a lot of what we're trying to do through our programs is industry outreach, right? To educate US reactor vendors and fuel cycle stakeholders about safeguards and security, the differences between security requirements and regulations in the international community versus what the US abides by and, and build awareness um, of the international market and what that can buy you. Um, international uh, regulators and a lot of these newcomer or embarking expanding countries they're not used to uh, establishing robust security and safeguards infrastructure or regulatory programs, right? So the more vendors can do now versus, you know, 10 years from now when they're ready to export their technology, it, re it reduces the regulatory burden on those customers. So it, it is a huge selling point. And when you're thinking about it from a safeguard standpoint, it takes about a decade to develop a technology to safeguard a facility and get it through the approval cycle process. So, even if you're a vendor thinking about exporting your technology a decade from now, it's, it's better to think about those safeguards challenges and requirements you may be subject to now versus later. Um, mm -hmm. So from NNSA, we're, we're uh, sending resources and funding labs uh, and their experts to work with vendors directly 
to help, uh, you know, you vendor, vendors don't necessarily have uh, safeguards and security experts on hand. So we're trying to supply that through our national lab. Thanks, Alaga. So, uh, Will, I want to go to you. Uh, we have a question in the chat that I think is 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 interesting to address. Uh, to address, and I'm going to try to paraphrase it. So, um, it has been the policy of the U.S. and, frankly, the international community to to minimize and ultimately eliminate the use of highly enriched uranium. But from an engineering side, and I often hear this from from our members that that um, you know, higher enrichments bring with it certain advantages, right? And we've seen that debate in the in the in the halo in the halo realm. Um, but you know, you often hear, well, if we can maybe if we can get a little bit above twenty percent, right? That there might be some you know some some uh, efficiency benefits or or uh, you know making something more compact. Um, you know, talk to me a little bit about where you see sort of civilian HEU policy currently and whether or not there there are any opportunities for um, um, you know maybe we'll call it MEU or or you know uh, you know triple IPAs if you will if you want to use the beer analogy what 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 does that look like from your perspective so obviously the I mean just in a theoretical sense the right approach is to risk or is to weigh risks and benefits right I mean you want to see you know what you would be risking and what you would be benefiting if you pursued such a policy. I was actually part of a National Academies Committee that examined the refueling of HEU reactors with LEU. And we looked at a variety of those reactors. And there was one in particular, which would be very difficult to, to um, refuel with LEU. They were having all kinds of troubles with the fuel design. Um, and our recommendation was to at least examine some sort of medium enrichment. Now, I would draw um, <clears throat> a distinction between that reactor, which is ex exists today and is using HEU, and the attempts to bring it down to L LEU, versus designing and building new reactors that would use HEU. And um, uh, so I guess I went through the first part of that to show that I'm not in principle opposed. This isn't a religious commitment. On the other hand, I think that there is a long track record of people deciding that we really should be minimizing the use of HEU. And I, and I sincerely believe that all of the efforts that have been done to convert research reactors to LEU have um, greatly strengthened the nonproliferation environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Will. So, uh, Jati, I'll come back to you here um, because I think I think this may be in. I think you said this was uh, near and dear to your heart. And again, uh, question off the uh, the Q and A. Um, but the common denominator to safety, security, and safeguards, and certainly different technical, technological approaches, is people and therefore personnel training. IMPO and IAEA have paid particular attention to this. However, how are the organizations and initiatives discussed today responding to this imperative? And I'll just sort of add on to the end of it, right? This, this falls within the, the larger you know, generational workforce challenges that, that especially the nuclear industry has is this sort of very pronounced double hump demographic camel where we're seeing, you know, that that older generation retiring and, and you know, how are we, you know, how are we making sure that we have the people to be able to do, you know, to meet all the aspirations that we have here? So um, I totally agree about uh, the demographic shift. Um, the baby boomers are, you know, leaving the, the workplace. Um, and while they boomed, um, nobody else, you know, followed their uh, path here. So we do have a, a significant dip in the working age population. I think that everybody is in agreement about this being a problem. Um, I, and I don't think it's unique to the nuclear industry. 
Um, we see in uh, other countries where the population rate uh, is not at replacement um, and all of the society is growing and there's more work to be done with less people. So in the nuclear industry, um, I think there's several initiatives to address that. He, he talks about INPO. I saw this comment, INPO and IEA, IAEAA actually talking and addressing and putting forth programs. I think NNSA, I think NE have also uh, followed suit with trying to do pipeline development. I know there's NEUP, the university programs, um, there's consortium that NNSA um, and, and multiple offices across NNSA are um, uh, doing to strengthen the relationship between universities and uh, laboratories. There's also uh, committed funds to do outreach to community college. So not even at the university level, but also at the trades level to support the different um, skills that we're gonna need <clears throat> that do not require a college or university degree. So I think that people are doing what, they're ca what they can. <clears throat> I also think another great uh, aspect of this and a way to address this is that um, we are getting more into machine learning and AI so that we can not only have more people who are interesting entering the industry, but we can uh, work smarter, not harder. So instead of just throwing manpower at a problem, we can work differently. Um, I mean, we saw that when they went from, you know, manual to digital instrumentation and how that improved efficiency across nuclear energy plants. Um, we're seeing that a lot with modeling. Well, we saw that a lot with modeling and that's moving even for, uh, more into the future with digital twins. So that is a big buzzword um, to get people experience. Maybe if it's not necessarily in these facilities and using this material, then they can at least have um, access to um, different functionalities that minute, mimic um, the actual systems to get the training on that. Um, but I, I do think there are a lot of different avenues in place and we are seeing um, a lot of people who do want to come into the nuclear industry. Um, if you, if you, you know, paid attention to the housing market, it's very expensive. And um, all the nuclear engineers that I know uh, have jobs that they can afford housing. So it's a, a very secure um, line of work to be in. Uh, nuclear material isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's, it will be around for tens of thousands of years. So um, that will definitely uh, be a, a long running job opportunity. Um, I think one of the issues that we have is actually getting our voices heard um, in the race to capture people who want to work in the science and technical industry. Um, I think, uh, you know, having some of the companies who um, are more uh, flash in the pans, I want to say, um, with their products and having those companies uh, have major layoffs and that sort of thing. We've seen a, a lot of influx um, of talent thanks to that, um, just being in the realm of, of tech and being able to uh, bring in those tech people. But also important, we're working on these uh, pathways for people who are already into their career, who might want to join the nuclear industry and working on those side, um, sideways switching, you know, taking a side step into the nuclear industry, because not only do we need science and technical people, but we need people who can communicate about nuclear energy, um, people who can do administration, IT, all of those supporting tasks as well. So Jatia, I'm risk, I'm I'm holding myself back to, to not uh, give a shameless plug for the professional certification programs that ANS is uh, developing, so I won't. But uh, we are getting close to the top of the hour. Anag, uh, I want to come in with another uh, question for you. It, I want to I throw a couple of particular sort of subtopics out to you and, and talk to me how it fits within your sort of larger strategy to work to get safeguards by design into it. So two things that get a lot of discussion. Uh, one is cybersecurity. Um, you know, to what extent do you guys touch on cybersecurity? And Jatia mentioned it before about, you know, thinking about 3S from, from a fuel management standpoint, right, that could potentially include, um, uh, you know, recycling regimes by some advanced reactors in the future. How do you approach those two issues generally? So on the cybersecurity standpoint, uh, there's a lot of energy and, and resources being thrown towards that problem and understanding the opportunities and risk landscape from the NSA standpoint. 
Um, we've had a robust program with the Office of International Nuclear Security working with international partners and helping them establish robust cybersecurity processes and programs and procedures. Uh, we support the IAEA also in developing guidance documents on how to establish uh, cybersecurity strategies and programs. Uh, you know, there's the 17T and 47G documentation that's from the IAEA. Those are great resources. Um, and, you know, we're trying to apply or take our expertise that we've cultivated and, and you know, that uh, leveraging as an, in the national lab for international partners and be able to translate that and communicating with the new U.S. nuclear industry, right? We're seeing um, an increased reliance now on, you know, remote operations, which means we'll have to turn towards remote monitoring. You know, a lot of uh, um, companies are looking at digital twins, as Jatia mentioned, right? So we're trying to understand the risks and opportunities posed by these emerging threats and, and technologies, trying to see what additional threat vectors do these introduce and how can we leverage a lot of these technologies for, for good. Um, so we're trying to promote cyber informed engineering, you know, in line with the security by design principles I mentioned earlier that we uh, were trying to help vendors think through. So it's not just from a physical protection standpoint or a response standpoint. It's also how can you protect your critical digital assets? What kind of processes, procedures, plans can you put in place now versus later? Um, so we're, we're trying to uh, tackle this holistically from the supply chain standpoint as well. Um, so I hope that answered your question. It does. It, it does. And, uh, and so it looks like we have a little bit more time left. W William, I've got one more for you. Um, and I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm going to pretty well form a question. I'm just going to read it to you. William, you, you talked about the different capabilities that have been deployed in Ukraine in a war zone, including drones, missiles, direct attacks um, that, you know, could, postulate a, a revisit of a design basis. Uh, yet the U.S. NRC applying the Turkey Point decision that Florida Power and Light does not need to defend against Cuban MiG-17 recognizes that these types of threats should be addressed by the U.S. government and not an individual utility. How do we address these concerns by placing the responsibility for new requirements on the entities most capable to prevent them both in the US and internationally. In other words, you know, I'll, I'll just add my own, to, my own thought to this, which is um, heretofore, uh, to this point, if you were in ar around the uh, Zaporizhia reactor in Ukraine, the safest spot heretofore has been inside the reactor as opposed to any place else. Now, you know, the question becomes the security responsibility for nuclear facilities. Is it, you know, obviously some of it's government, some of it could be in the design itself, but how, how do you see the responsibility, the, the, the uh, allocation of responsibility there? So to some extent, I think the question contains the answer, which is that it's got to be a mix of those responsible players we may want to revisit the mix that we have traditionally um, used, which has been that acts of war are, are matters for national responsibility, not for the operators. And while I don't believe that any nuclear power plant could withstand, withstand an armored division, I do think that it, it might be important for nuclear power plant operators to anticipate what might happen. Um, you mentioned that the safest place has been within the reactor, and to an extent that's true with Zaporizhia, but it's also true that the um, Ukrainian operators of Zaporizhia have been subject to murder, kidnapping, and torture. Um, so it may be that operators of newer nuclear power plants in areas where conflict is possible may want to rethink exactly what sort of, how they support their employees. Mm -hmm. um, another way of looking at these things are, my understanding is that the Australians in their one of their research reactors, they actually uh, quote birdcage it. In other words, they put up a metal barrier that would have uh, an effect of uh, making a drone attack less viable uh, and possibly even a missile attack because it would cause detonation away from the walls of the reactor. Um, these are all things that I think can be examined. And I think 
it's no longer viable to say, well, you know, acts of war matters for governments to con consider. Uh, operators don't need to, to think about them at all. I think that um, we actually need to develop some best practices in this area. Well, uh, thank you for that. And, and at this point, we are at the top of the hour. I want to thank our three panelists. It's been a great conversation. Um, let everybody know online that we will be posting the recording of this session uh, as soon as we can, certainly, uh, certainly this week. Um, so on behalf of the ANS, thank you for participating. Uh, thank you all for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful questions. You bet.